Okay, uh, we should start on time. And so it's my pleasure to, um, to invite you to join us in this um, uh, webinar series, which is named after uh, my good friends, Dr. Rebecca Brent and Dr. Rich Felder. Uh, many of you were at our inaugural first webinar of the series, uh, which was um, sometime in early September. And uh, so today we have our second webinar of this Brent Felder webinar series, Effective Teaching and Learning. An important objective of this series is to, is to create and nurture and, and help build a community of practice of uh, you know, people who are um, passionate about um, making sure that whatever we teach is actually being learned by our students in effective teaching and learning, and that is relevant to the needs of uh, the world and society around us. So, so thank you all for joining. Uh, just again, to quickly show you uh, the other webinars that are uh, lined up for you. They, we have um, approximately once every two months, we have these webinars lined up. And so we have uh, one in January after this, uh, coming to us from Portugal and so on. And so we have uh, you know, all the way up to June 19, 2024, we'll keep you busy, all right? Mm -hmm. So I hope you can join all of us. And, and you all know that, uh, that all of these uh, webinars are being recorded and will be available on uh, on the on the canvas platform so sweeter make sure it's being recorded so uh and then and then then on the canvas platform we encourage you to uh communicate and discuss with each other so if you're not yet on canvas platform just uh, send an email to sweeter uh, and he will put up his uh, email uh, shortly in the chat box so with that, I'm going to introduce our, I see Bill Williams is here, one of our future speakers. And Richard Felder, you woke up early morning. You look like you just got up. <laughs> good morning, Richard. Good to see you. Okay, great. And my friend Funso Folado is here. A lot of good, lot of good uh, friends from the global community have joined us. So thank you for joining us. Either I just put up his, uh, his, um, uh, Email ID. So, uh, Dr. Roger, Roger Hatcraft, another good friend of mine, is a civil engineer with more than 30 years of experience in improving engineering education. He has published many papers on problem and project based learning, popularly known as PBL, and the use of online technology to support student centered learning to meet the needs of engineering employers. He was instrumental in introducing a project-based curriculum in civil engineering at Monash University and in several dis dis disciplines at RMIT. He established the Master of Sustainable Practice and Bachelor of Sustainable Systems Engineering, both at RMIT. Uh, Roger was an ALTC discipline scholar and has been a member of several national learning and teaching projects. And he has consulted on PBL to universities, both nationally and internationally. His current passion to develop national approaches to engineering curricula. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing, Roger, and hand this over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, okay, so let me share my screen. Um, always a trick to get the right one here. Um, okay, play from the start. So you should now be seeing the, the correct screen. Uh, if I yep. press the share button. You are able to see it, yep. Yes, very good. Um, <clears throat> so tonight, uh, I wanted to address the, <laughs> the question of why engineering must change and how to go about it. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's wonderful to speak to an international audience in this way. Um, so before I start, let me acknowledge, let me acknowledge country. So in this country, um, in Australia, it's become a, a lovely tradition to acknowledge the original traditional owners of the land from which I speak today, which happens to be uh, the city of Melbourne in Australia, uh, and the traditional owners of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. 
And we pay our respects to elders past and present as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this ancient land. It's a nice picture of what Melbourne might, might have looked like once. <clears throat> so right before we start, I, I, I borrowed from Rich Felder's um, um, hymn, hymn book and thought, well, it would be really interesting to find out where people are from. So I'm wondering if we can run that first poll. All right, so so um, I, I borrowed one of Rich's slides, um, which is uh, Lodkowski's model of adult learning, learning motivation. It seemed like a, a, a lovely segue between between our presentations, and it was really a reminder for all those who who uh, watched the previous webinar of the the, the big ideas that were mentioned. So um, you know this combination of expertise. Um, you know, when students come to our classes, they want they want people who know know what they're talking about. They want to see the relevance. So I, I, I also want to talk about that tonight. Um, they want praxis, they want to put things into into practice. So they want action plus reflection. So we'll do a little bit of that. Uh, we'll do a bit of teamwork. And, uh, and, and there'll be choices, really, there'll be choices that you each make in, um, in how you engage in the activities and, and the, the knowledge that you bring to share with other people. And we'll have a chat channel, chat channel will be open as we go. And uh, uh, Krishna will interrupt me if, if there are some really good questions along the way. And I've deliberately left places uh, for questions as well. So uh, jot down those questions as they occur to you. Okay, so so the last webinar, uh, Rebecca and Rich discussed how to run an engaging class or workshop based on that model of, of adult learning motivation. And what I want to talk about today is what we teach in our classes and then how we adapt our curricula to prepare graduates for the future. So that's that's the big idea. So my favorite question is always, what problem are we solving? And the, the problem we're solving is what do students need to learn and how can we help them learn that um, in our classes, in our curriculum? So the, the, the presentation is basically divided into three parts. Uh, I want to talk about capabilities. So that's the what, what, what do students need to learn? What do we know about that? Uh, I want to talk about studios, which is maybe a, a fancy name for project-based learning or problem-based learning, uh, and, and tell you a little of what we've done at, at my university uh, in Sydney. And, and lastly, I want to say, well, how do we take those good ideas and turn them, how, how do we adapt our curriculum? So if you've been in this game for any length of time, you know that there's been no end of international reviews and, and people writing about what we should be doing. And in this country, the most recent review is, is this one here, uh, the ACED Engineering 2035 report. This stands for the Australian Council of Engineering Deans. But before that, you'll be familiar with some of the others. There's the American Society for Civil Engineers. They have their body of knowledge. Um, Sherry Shepard and company produced uh, a terrific book um, in 2008, Educating Engineers, Designing for the Future of the Field. There's the UK Henley Report, there's Educating the Engineer of 2020 and so on and so forth. Um, and, um, and I've put a couple of books here by, by a fellow Australian, James Trevelyan, um, The Making of, of an Expert Engineer and Learning Engineering Practice. And James will be giving the February um, seminar, I believe, webinar, and Sherry Shepard, I think, is in April next year. So they're definitely um, workshops to look forward to and to and to attend. So we've got lots of ideas, um, and what we increasingly read in all of these reports is that there's a greater diversity of engineering work. There's rapid advances in technologies. There's changes in how we how we work. So 
you know, whole idea of digital twins or digital engineering. Uh, there's changing societal expectations of engineers, there's evolving human needs. Um, and there's increasing globalization, all that was somewhat interrupted by COVID. So the, the profession is being pushed, pushed from a number of different directions. So if we talk to employers, which is what the, the Council of Deans have done through their report, um, what do employers tell us? Well, they tell us, well, of course, we want people who are technically competent because that's, that's, that's what we do. But we need people who think in systems. They need to be holistic thinkers. They need to be able to deal with complex problems. And they need to be able to sit down with stakeholders and do problem finding, not just problem solving. They need to help the stakeholders find, understand the problem that they're facing. There are life cycle and societal considerations, expectations and trust of the profession. Uh, there are collaborations and interactions across constituencies and digital tools and technologies that I've mentioned already. So these are the things that we're hearing from our people. So our first um, interactive activity, our first breakout, um, Oh no, this is not a break. This is just, just a chat channel. I just want you to think for a, a minute or so and then put into the chat, what are the things that you're hearing from your, your industry friends, your industry associations, your, the magazines you read? What, what, what are you hearing about the kinds of skills that, and capabilities that students need and the kinds of different graduates that uh, employers are looking for? So. I thought I'd set aside just three minutes for this, so have a quick thing. Okay. Pop, pop something That's, in the chat. Okay, so troubleshooting real-time real industrial yeah. problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep coming. Thank you, Badmini. Yeah. Global competency. Mm -hmm. Industry needs, design and comp comprehensive skills. Mm -hmm. Innovative ideas. Problem solving, mm -hmm. critical thinking, communication. Adaptability, graduates, uh, how in, uh, how well, now they're coming, coming really <laughs> fast. <laughs> in, in industry, professional skill development, yeah. team mm -hmm. members, interest team, mm -hmm. critical thinking, collaboration, problem solving, good communication skills, creative ideas, collaboration with industry, skill sets required by industry, <laughs> adaptability, yeah. teamwork, multidisciplinary skills, graduates, uh, in, in employability skills, networking, Communication teamwork, creativity, critical thinking, analytical skills and teamwork, being able to stuff the do stuff that then just now, that then just know the stuff, analytical mm -hmm. communication skills, okay. teamwork, ethics, sustainable yeah, so solutions, honest. multitasking, so trending mm -hmm. technology, programming skills, solutions within a short period of time, project management skills. Quick learning, teamwork in diverse teams, empathy, mm -hmm. readiness to work hard, mm -hmm. honesty, understanding student requirements, risk taking, mm -hmm. development of mm -hmm. solutions, mm -hmm. humility. Okay, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Mm -hmm. Flexible with work hours, stability, leadership skills, being able to teach yourself new skills. Okay, problem analysis, creativity, flexibility, self-confidence, sustainability. Okay, well, wow, it's a lot of very good, interesting ideas. Lifelong learner, identifying the right problems, niche ideas and thinking in multi-perspective, teamwork without separating parts of the task for each one, ready to learn and adapt, handling complex problems, openness mm. okay well that's that's a tremendous list and um uh, yeah, so in, sure some, is. In, in some ways uh uh you know that the, it's the wisdom of the crowd isn't it that the collectively we know these things um and what we sometimes struggle with is how do we develop those capabilities in our students um in a curriculum that's often very traditional of uh, you know teaching from textbooks 
Uh, but it's fantastic to see that list because in a sense, you all know, <laughs> you all know what you need to do. Um, so so uh, the next slide uh, is also an activity. Um, and what I've asked you to do is to say, well, and, and I've just selected some of the things that have uh, have already been presented by by all of you. Um, I'm just going to, if we, if we could pop that up as a poll, I'm hoping that that's all ready to go. Um, what I wanted you to do is to just pick, I think I think you should be able to, I'm not sure whether you can pick one or two, but um, pick just pick one. the things. Yeah. Yeah, pick pick more than one, but don't pick them all. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, what 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 are the things that you most need to develop at your place? Um, yeah, is that your uh, place where you work? Yeah, where you work. Uh, yeah, that's being okay, shared right now. So, yeah. so if everyone can see that. So everyone can see the results. Yeah. Yeah. So pr pr probably unsurprising, but it's it's really good to see actually quite quite a lot of strength across all of those categories, aren't there? Even the technical expertise, there are plenty of people who think, well, we you know we it's it's still something we need to work on. Um, and so the holistic systems approaches is, is uh, out in front, followed by collaboration with industry and the community. Mm -hmm. um, those two things kind of travel hand in hand. Uh, difficult to do one without the other. Uh, problem finding the stakeholders, which also joins into that process. And then we've got things like life cycle and societal considerations um, and so on. Well, that's terrific um, and, and really good to see. Okay, so what we, if we're going to do those things, if we're going to, that, that wonderful list of, of ideas that, that you've all presented, in the chat and we need to, to make curriculum change and we need better integrated curriculum that focuses on the development of all those professional skills and we need to do much more collaborative and open-ended problem finding and solving in multidisciplinary project teams so that combines society with complexity with systems and we also need a greater emphasis on digital design tools uh, which have just become such a commonplace activity in the workplace and it's it's a step above i think where digital tools were even 10 years ago that that there are now large suites of very integrated um, software that students encounter in in the workplace and they should have some sense of those things um, before they leave the university and to do that, we need stronger links with industry and the community. And they, they were the recommendations that came out of our 2035 report. And we also know from that report that, because we went and studied, well, what do leading programs around the world look like? And, and this work was done by uh, Professor Carolyn Crosswaite from the University of Queensland. And we know that the truly outstanding programs have very distinctive program philosophies. So they've been designed with, with the big idea in mind. Um, and we can come to some of those examples, perhaps in, the, in questions. They engage with industry and community, and that includes placements and projects for students. They make systematic use of student-centered project-based learning usually beginning in first year. They use human-centered and, and empathic design projects. So um, online simulations, competitions, role plays. There's a range of authentic assessments and they have availability of en enabling people, processes, systems and resources, often, often through their engagement with industry as already mentioned. And I put the link in there for the, the reports if you want to go and get those, but you'll probably find them quickly enough with Google. <clears throat> so what I want to do now is just get, and we've done a really great job with the chat so far, but this is a chance to do a bit of a breakout experience um, <clears throat> to just share some of the good practice that's happening at your place. So it's really a, a 
process of crowdsourcing some good ideas. And um, it also gives you the experience of being a student, I think, because I know when our students were, were pushed into online learning in the last two or three years because of COVID, um, they didn't all take it up with the, with the utmost enthusiasm. Um, and sometimes, um, as uh, I'm sure you've observed, students will go into a breakout room, not turn their camera on, not say a word. And um, I'm hoping that doesn't happen tonight. So <clears throat> the activity for the breakout room, so if we, if we can divide people up into uh, uh, I don't know, groups of five, perhaps, um, is just okay. pick one of these three things. Mm -hmm. So think think about digital design tools, multidisciplinarity or industry collaboration. Think of a story. Is there a story from your place to tell either something that you're doing or something that you know a colleague is doing that you could share with your fellow breakout participants? So they well, would have to come, come back and put it on chat so everybody can read it, right? After they come back. That's right. Yep. So yeah, they would just, have to think about add. it and start, talk about it for five to 10 minutes, I think we'll keep it 10 minutes. So yeah. take them time to go in and out mm -hmm. and then we'll bring them back after 10 minutes. And then, yeah. um, you know, everybody's encouraged to, you know, put their uh, brief outline in the chat chat channel about any one of these three topics, right? You any know, one of those three topics? Engineering design and... tools, multidisciplinarity, which is social and technical and industry mm -hmm. collaboration. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if there are any questions that anybody wants to ask. Sure, let's uh, let's point. go to the chat. Everybody get active in the chat and, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, Prakash Hegde from room number 16 has given us a, a big list of things that they discussed mm -hmm. in the uh, in the room. Oops. And uh, they looked in the right, they give another bullet bulleted list. Wow, we can, th these chat messages can be collected by the way. Uh, so we can actually compile these later on. Uh, but if there's any one, you know, if you, uh, I mean, it's, it's difficult to read a whole list. So if anybody wants to just focus on one or two, one things, and then, and then uh, your practice. Okay, don't tell us what you discussed, but what had the, uh, what were the details of what you discussed? Okay, problem discussed: reducing, recycling, reusing electronic garbage. Okay, new tools to estimate the footprints released from garbage, uh, RRR process. Okay. Uh, new algorithms for statistical data analysis, weight activity. Unfortunately, I have no camera and mic in this computer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> specific, specifics. Okay, not 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 topics, but uh, specific specifics. Okay, okay. Here's one. Uh, we felt using digital technologies in core disciplines of engineering, like mechanical civil, is a bit dampener in some in Indian colleges. Okay, well, I don't know what what, what you mean by that. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit. When you mean it's a bit dampener digital technologies okay then uh, yeah give us give us specifics don't just say we talked about industry economic collaboration something that catches your attention as something that's unique that has been done in the particular uh, college social immersion community engagement identifying societal problems anything new exciting that uh, was shared that you could take back with you okay admissions <laughs> okay Discuss industry collaboration. Can I ask a question? Okay, Deborah Blaine, come in. Okay, can you unmute uh, uh, Deborah Blaine? Anybody? Can I, can I see that? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, um, many, I think many of the programs that I've been reading now in the chat um, are also so a lot of the innovative. Um, programs that allow students to work in multidisciplinary teams or um, um, in international team building and um, solving problems and everything are parallel to the main program and are optional extras. But our programs are already so full, um, which means that a lot of our students will struggle to engage in, in these kind of more holistic programs that could really be giving them the skills that they need. So how do we keep the technical content that we need to have in our in our degrees and also do these holistic things? Yeah, I I, <laughs> I think the, the, the fallacy is that our programs are full and that we're teaching a whole lot of things that, that in reality don't need to be taught, but we 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 we're all convinced that they do need to be taught. Um 
it's it's kind of the last part of my presentation to talk in a bit more detail about that. Um, uh, and but the, the short answer is to is to really focus on what what are the fundamentals that need to be taught, and then everything else can be a a, a project type subject. Um, and then that's where you bring in the industry opportunities and and so on, the industry projects. Um, but let, let me get to that in, okay. in you know, half an hour or so. Roger, shall we, uh, I'm going to request participants to raise their hand and I'll call on people and we'll just take a few more comments. Okay. Uh, because they unmute okay. themselves, they can speak. Okay, mm -hmm. raise your hand mm -hmm. if you want to speak and then I'll, you, know, you, know, you can un then unmute yourself and, um, and speak. If anybody wants to tell us something exciting that you came across during the... Uh, Discussion. Just raise your hand. There's a feature in the feature that you can use to raise your hand. Okay, we got uh, Venkat Raghuram Mantri. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, this is regarding the admission intake. Uh, what we talk is like uh, uh, most often mechanical and civil engineering students, I think uh, uh, they are not exposed to the kind of digital classrooms which uh, the other uh, departments are exposed to. Uh, that's one uh, constant complaint from the students saying even when we uh, put them on special training, uh, they feel that uh, they are not exposed that much to the industry or to real life models. These are constraints in a uh, small uh, Indian college where you can't bring in automobile or uh, construction technology into the classroom. And on the other hand, it's not directly supported by the uh, digital uh, concepts of having the sophisticated digital classrooms also. Whereas for programming and other side, uh, it's easy for them to do the simulations and uh, other modelings. This is one Roger. we discussed in our groups. Roger, you want to comment on that and we go to Vahid after that? Yeah, I, you know, again, it's about it's about changing the balance between t teaching the fundamentals. Um, so I'm a civil engineer, so teaching shear force and bedding moment diagrams, and then quickly getting students into being able to actually do structural design. We want to spend far too much time teaching students analysis and not enough time teaching them design. And once we get to design, we then the, the digital tools become our friends. Um, and we've done that at another university where I've worked. We, we had second year students using structural analysis software to, to do structural design. So you can do this. Often the software vendors will make the software freely available at a very reduced cost. So okay. it's, it's a case of changing the- Wahid, come in, speak. You can unmute yourself. Oh, oh hi, thank you. Um, my question is regarding the, you mentioned about in one of your slides about change, curriculum, curriculum change required. Um, how often do engineering institutions need to change or update their programs to have the uh, graduates have the right skills needed by employers? Mm, that's a good question, isn't it? I, um, I work for the Royal Academy of Engineering and I manage a engineering skills where they're most needed program. And we work with so many universities around the world. Uh, so there are different approaches, but obviously there are the resources are needed for any changes, but generally what is the consensus around, around this topic to change or update? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I suspect the answer is somewhere between five and 10 years. Um, it takes five years to bed something down. So if you change it too quickly, you're, you're in a process of constant change. I think the other thing is to rethink what curriculum looks like. So at the moment, curriculum, every, every component of the curriculum is kind of a, a locked box where it's, it's filled with all this content that must be taught or that we all believe must be taught. But if you, if you look more closely and you say, well, actually only half of this content really must be taught, and that's the absolute fundamentals of our discipline. And to be honest, most of that's taught by the end of second year. And the rest of it is really optional experiences because your graduates, our graduates will go off in a thousand different directions. And things that they've learned in, in throughout their program, much of it they will never use again or never see again. 
So why, why was it important for them to learn it? Um, what we want to do is to focus on the really big outcomes, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a little while as well. Um, so that if half of the curriculum is more project-based, those projects can change every year, every semester. So your curriculum becomes naturally self-renewing because if your industry friends are coming in every year with new projects, it just keeps changing. And, and then somewhat less frequently, you could go back and look at your fundamental subjects and, and ask, do I really need to teach this anymore? Or is this now all done in software? And, um, you know, okay. we just don't have to spend so much time on it. Thank you, Vahid. Let's go to one more. Dr. Lal Mohan Baral, unmute yourself, please. Uh, hello. Good afternoon, sir. So I am from Bangladesh, actually uh, from Arsenal University of Science and Technology uh, in Dhaka. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to share with all of you you some success factor regarding the in industry university collaboration uh, as i am from textile engineering department recently uh, we get feedback from our university industry partner where approximately 300 graduates are working from our department so the industry people they identified the our graduate has very good technical knowledge but some somehow they uh, recognize they have some uh, say soft skill knowledge, lack of soft skill knowledge. So recently we collaborated with them, and for the industry, um, uh, you know, the training for for a group of students. That means approximately forty students, and they are agreed to give the soft skill training along with their internship. Uh, with with uh, for upgrading their soft skill development as well as they are agreed to give some uh, chances opportunity to uh, do I think I think we might have lost Dr. Lal Mohan. Raja, you want to comment on? Um. Oh, um, it, that sounds like a, a terrific idea. Um, and 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 I think we also need to be doing that soft skill development on campus so that when they go out on internship, they're, they're ready for it. And, and I'll come to that in a little while. Um, so let's let's move on. Sure. Um, I can see I can see time is time is marching on for us. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, so really, you share, your, share your screen. You have to share your screen yeah. again. Oh, oh, have I, have <laughs> I lost that? Oh. Uh, do, do, do. Hello. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Share screen. Okay. Is that good now? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what 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 we need more of. Uh, so this this I I borrowed from. Uh, an issue of tomorrow's professor, uh, which is a newsletter. I, I, th I think it's it's no longer issued, but you can see that there were at least 1800 issues of tomorrow's professor. So if you Google tomorrow's professor, Stanford University, you'll find it. Fantastic collection of good advice. Um, <clears throat> six key principles for student learning experiences, which overlap really nicely with, with Lobkowski's um, you know, model of, of active learning motivation. So challenging ideas and people, active engagement, supportive environments, that's that's us, active real world learning, collaborative, reflective, that's that's what we want to build. Um, we'll skip over questions, we've really done that. So I want to just talk now about studios at, at UTS, at University of Technology, Sydney. And one particular innovation, uh, which in some ways really accelerated our adoption of studios and that was summer studios which we ran for three years in 2018 19 and 20 and it was a place of experimentation for us and for students um, and it was an elective for, for for our students so it kind of goes to deborah's question which is how do you get students engaged in some of these things um, 
Um, so this was a way of us trying it out in the first place without, without causing too much um, grief. So the learning objectives for Summer Studio is a really interesting uh, situation. We had about 180 students enrolled across about a dozen different topics. So each studio is fairly small. If you do the maths, that's about 15 to 20 students per, uh, per studio. But they all had the same learning objectives is that, that they all had to be able to engage with stakeholders, um, apply design thinking, demonstrate technical skills, document collaboration, and conduct self, peer, and team reflection, uh, which are all the, the, the good ideas that we've been talking about so far. And these match our graduate attributes as it happens. And our graduate attributes, there are six of them. Um, so we have one very special one, which is about indigenous knowledge systems. And you remember that I started off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. Um, and the other five um, are socially responsible. And, and that was, has been mentioned in the chat already, uh, you know, ethical conduct and so on. We need graduates who are design oriented, uh, they're problem solvers, that, but they're also technically proficient. Uh, they're collaborative and communicative and they're personally reflective. So they're, they're our big ideas. They're our, this is what makes a whole engineer. So when we, when we uh, designed this summer studio, it was a really, a really interesting outcome was that when we asked for expressions of interest, we got several expressions of interest from students who said, we want to lead studios, um, which is something which we just did not expect. And I think we had four studios that were led by students. So there was the humanitarian engineering one, the smart cities one, um, the space challenge, and it might've been the cybersecurity one. And some of the others have run at other times um, over those three years. And that group of young men there were the ones who did the Vivid Light Show, uh, who built, built that model behind them and designed the, the, the lighting installation. Um, and I, can say, I will say a little bit more about how it all worked um, a little bit later. Um, but what one student commented, on this six week experience was that they, they just found this totally transformative. It was the open-ended scope, the freedom, the creativity. And uh, they said, I had freedom to learn using my own practical experiences instead of a regimented assessment schedule. So for many students, this is the first time they'd seen project-based learning in this kind of way, uh, an open-ended problem where they could go and uh, seek the solution for themselves. But what we didn't understand at the time was how important it also was for the academics involved. So the students said, oh, this is great. This is the best subject we've ever had. And uh, when are we going to have more of these? Um, but we had academics who came away and said, this, this is the best subject I've ever taught. And I'd never want to teach that old way again. Um, so that was fantastic. And now we have more than 80 studios across our different engineering and IT programs. So it was kind of, it was like lighting a fuse um, and it's just cascaded through the, through the faculty, which has been absolutely fantastic. So the studios now are an essential part of the curriculum, which addresses Deborah's problem of we, we need to, um, we need to get this into the curriculum, not sitting on the side where only some students get to do it. Um, <clears throat> So I wanted to pause there and just get you to jump back into the breakout rooms, perhaps, perhaps a bit shorter this time. We, maybe we can do it in five or six minutes to just share a, a time when things have changed at your place. So how, how do you make change happen? Um, and it might be just a small scale thing. It might be just changing a lab or, or, um, or uh, <laughs> changing the way you use PowerPoint. Um, but, but some, some time when you thought, oh, there, there has to be a better way of doing this and, and just tried a small experiment. Um, now, what have I said there? So can we, can we divide? We, let's, let's, do you want them to go in breakouts again? Yeah, I think so. Or, or 
unless you think we could do it quickly in the chat. Do you think that let, could let's work? just do it in chat this time? Maybe let them let them post online uh, in a chat box a story. Okay, just focus yeah. on this. I, mean, I know many other important questions are important, but in this particular next five minutes, just focus on small projects, small changes, and you know, share a story with just succeeded. Okay, that you made, uh, and 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 this will help others, encourage others to you know to think about similar things. Okay, small changes. Okay, let's let's get the yeah. uh, everybody active in thinking about small changes that you made, and I will uh, keep thinking about. Um, a small project, okay, Deborah says small projects with peer assessment that has worked for her. Okay, so Vijay Lakshmi, mm -hmm. uh, higher cognitive mm -hmm. assessment. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, if you can explain that better. Uh, okay, then Roger, okay, Roger Hadcraft is Roger responding to Jim <laughs> Trevelyan's question about can you circulate yeah. a paper detailing yeah. practicalities? Yeah. And, yeah. and Roger says yes. Okay, then uh, Nitya says many projects in a group have worked. Comprehensive viva voce oral questions at the end of the semester with peer student mm -hmm. review has worked. Engineering projects and community service as a course has worked. Introducing design thinking, uh, programming assessment in hack banks, uh, internships of two weeks for students in automobile engineering has worked. Uh, at Geet, uh, then uh, using simulation of the set of questions following them will help teach the learning objectives. Uh, then you have uh, Internships, of course, problem-based learning at early stage of undergraduate mm -hmm. curriculum. Alumni interaction has worked. Uh, mini projects, engineers without broader mm -hmm. projects. Uh, the open book assignments have, have worked. Then uh, introducing tutorials help to achieve higher order program objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, then self-reflection on areas of improvement on a Google form after a test that has worked. Uh, then concepts need to. Uh, Let's see, student project with real life problem for industry. Okay, survey of solutions for an engineering program. Uh, programming contests in hacker rank. Uh, case study with field visit and internship. Peer to peer learning through student clubs. Social internship has worked. Theory come practical course with alumni and industry experts. Evening events mm -hmm. for students with experts from industry. Outside funding to introduce mm -hmm. active learning to introduce and call. rubrics for assessment work, concurrent theory and industry work. Hackathons, more uh, modeling simulations so, and summer internships. Yeah. Okay. So for quite a lot probably. of but quite a lot of thoughts yeah. coming and came out there, yeah. So, yeah, so, lots, so, so lots obviously there's a lot of good successes out there. We just have to start, start that, that, sharing that's them. That's right. <laughs> so, so, so again, you know, that collectively everyone knows what, what needs to be known. It's let, just let, Roger, let, have... At this point, let me intervene just a minute based on the conversation mm -hmm. that Rich and, Rich and you and I had in the break, breakout session. Mm -hmm. I want to remind all of you that you know, this is, we're building a community of practice and most of you, I think, are on Canvas. Uh, so make it a habit to get on Canvas and put some of this, some of your thoughts on Canvas to share mm -hmm. with others. Mm -hmm. So maybe once a week, get onto Canvas and read what others have posted, and we'll try to get some activity, more activity going on Canvas, which Roger and myself and some of the others. So that should be our our um, uh, you know community of practice because you can see, as you can see yeah. from the chat in the last three minutes, you know we had 100, 100 uh, examples of uh, of small things that worked. Wow, this, we should feel good about it, right? Okay, go ahead, Roger. Yeah. And and uh, uh, Rich Rich Feld has just reminded us all that that the only way you can do these things is to realise you're going to have to take some stuff out, um, and and make make time. And I I'll talk um, about our mechanical engineering program, which has been revised in the last year or two, uh, in a little while, and uh, and talk about how we went and did that. Anyway, let let me. Let me quickly skip on because I've realized we're having such a good time here that time is slipping through our fingers. Um, I, I want to talk quickly about the design principles we used um, just in a couple of slides. Um, and first of all, I've already mentioned design thinking, which um, many of you will know about and, and which is just a fantastically simple way, of, particularly in the early 
year um, in the first year probably of helping students to understand well, how do you go about design and um, and that became a really important part of summer studios and has been picked up in other studios across the faculty. The other key idea we used was agile project management. Um, um, and and so we ran these studios over six weeks. So there were two classes every week, so there were effectively 12 classes. And we ran it as, as basically four sprints. So a sprint is, is a, a coherent um, time where you set out with an objective and you deliver you deliver something that, that is then assessed by the team. So in our case, the first sprint, which is from, let's say from class number one to class number three, was the problem definition in the studios. What, what, what problem are we solving? And then from class three to, from say class three to class six is, is exploring solutions and technologies and whatever else is relevant to that particular studio. And then the, the, the third sprint was around prototype design. And then the, the fourth sprint was around uh, prototype uh, refinement and submission of the, the whole portfolio. And then we had a, a wrap up at the end where every class exhibited their work and, and uh, students uh, walked around and had a look at all the work um, that was being done in the other studios. And we invited our deputy vice chancellor to come along and look at all the wonderful work. <clears throat> so it was a, a celebration. And coming back to the, to the Lodkowski's model of, of um, adult learning motivation, it really was <clears throat> about all of these things. So it was about uh, running studios by experts. So that was the expertise thing. It was industry relevant. So that's where students really engaged. And I should say the studios that were were co-led co by senior students were the best and, and most popular because the, the senior students really knew what the, the, uh, the junior students needed to know. So that the relevance of content was really, really sharp there. Um, it was very much action and reflection. So those sprints were, were, were uh, cycles of action and reflection. It was all teamwork and the students had choices of topics. It was very interactive. So we really did put the model into action, even, even though we didn't know that uh, the model by that name at that time. Um, look, I'm going to skip on quickly and come back to questions, perhaps. And I, what, I, what I want to do is to just, and again, what, perhaps we can use the chat for this purpose is what's, what's a studio or a project that you could run in your discipline? Thinking about design as the fundamental idea, or if you don't operate in the design phase, it might be a, a feasibility question, it could be an operations type question, it could be a, a, some other aspect of the, um, it could be construction or manufacturing, it could be another aspect of the engineering life cycle but something that's embedded in engineering practice. And then how might you engage stakeholders uh, and industry in that, in that project? Um, so we're going to do this at breakout room, but I can see yeah. us running out of time. So- No, no, I think I let's think, do it, Roger. I think it's a good idea to do it. So let, um, let's, okay. let's just take a few minutes. I'll, I'll ask people to raise their hands and just more three or four uh, examples of studio ideas. What do you think, Roger? Sure, we have to be quick. Quick, yeah, let's make it quick. Okay, quick. I'm gonna I'm gonna make it really quick. Uh, or anybody ideas? Well, raise your hand and an idea that you might have discussed for a studio in your particular institution. Let us hear. Any of you? Raise your hand and we'll I'll have you talk. Radhika Devi. Okay, tell us what idea you have for a studio at your institution. Uh, sir, as such, like we three people from the room number seven discuss what has happened with us. So there was a design thinking course that uh, uh, CBIT has implemented as well as one college from Tamil Nadu has implemented and we were also implementing, sir. So we didn't call it as a design uh, studio or something like that. We were calling all the three of us, we named it as design thinking course, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was uh, rolled out for 
first year, second semester students. Okay. Uh, almost on an average, okay. uh, even I, I, with CBIT, even with topic, us. Is there a topic that they are using to design? No, no such specific okay. topic, sir. Okay. So even for us, there is no such specific topic that we were using. Okay. So maybe because of the logistics problem. Okay, let's go uh, to Availability another. of faculty. Thank you, Radhika. Let's have Thank another, you, another hand raised. Another hand raised, some a specific <laughs> idea of what uh, design studio, or, or not design, I mean, what studio you might uh, might uh, might do. Value added course. Okay, raise your hand and speak, folks. If not, Roger is just waiting to get back to his slides. So that, that, that's right. Uh, Vijay Lakshmi. Okay, Vijay Lakshmi will take yours and we'll give Roger Roger the stage again. Yeah. Vijay Lakshmi, tell yes. us anything about a studio that you uh, yes, can, plan like, uh, are, can plan to do. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we are running a design thinking for social innovation course in a studio mode only. So where uh, we adopted the Stanford model, even in the discussion room or like a breakout session, we discussed on the same thing. The other college, uh, the person who has participated in the uh, breakout session, they, they are sending students to the Stanford for training on the design thinking. Upon returning in turn, the students will train the remaining students. That's what okay. the model they adopted. But okay. we are adopted uh, the Stanford model for a design thinking where uh, societal problems we are going to solve uh, through community engagement. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Vijay Lakshmi. And we'll get back to Roger. You're on. So you got to share your okay. screen. Show your screen and okay. keep moving. Thanks. We have another 15 Thanks. minutes for you to wrap up. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, share. Okay. Uh, I, I would encourage other people to put your ideas in the chat box. We will collect them. So yes. sorry to not uh, not allow everybody to speak, but uh, just put them in the chat box. We'll collect them and put them on canvas. Okay. Thank you all. Yeah. Go ahead, Roger. And, and just a follow up to the previous speaker. Um, our, we've we've sent students to Stanford as well. We call those the uh, university university innovation fellows. So that's a great program. Um, here we go. Um, okay, so so I, I want to speak briefly about how to remake a traditional curriculum, and and I think the typical responses and and is is something like this. Oh no, it's it's impossible. There's too much content. The senior professors will get in the way, um, and it's just too difficult. Um, you know, don't, don't don't even think about it. But one th one thing that occurred to me um, eventually was that. We think of engineering curricula as a whole, but it's actually a, a series of little parts and they're all kind of pushed together into, a, into our overall curriculum. So if, for example, you look at civil engineering at my university, it's made up of all these components. So there's some mathematics, there's some professional practice, there's some basic science, there's an introduction to the discipline, there's construction, there's mechanics, there's geomechanics, there's water, there's technical options, free options, capstone project. All of this is 32 units. And, and we think of that as a whole civil engineering curriculum, but it's just it's just a bunch of parts, a bunch of Lego bricks that have been kind of um, pushed together. So if you want to make change, you can actually make change at the micro level by, well, for one thing, you can change a single subject, um, which is probably yours but then work with the people around you. Um, and you're usually probably working in a small team and you can start to make change from a small team point of view. But what we did with mechanical engineering, which I'll show you on the next slide, is we, we boiled it down to, there are five basic sub disciplines in mechanical engineering. There's um, kind of structural ideas, there's machines, there's dynamics and control, there's manufacturing, and I always forget the fifth one, oh, thermofluids. Um, and we said, right, each of those can only be taught in two subjects. So you can only teach, you've got two subjects to teach the fundamentals of your sub-discipline, and then we will have studios where students practice those skills and extend them. And also opens up the possibility of multidisciplinary studios. It also opens up, as, as was mentioned earlier in response to the question, the option of renewing the program as you go along because you simply change the projects from one semester to another. And it also gets students into action early. So our students start doing projects from semester one. Um, so this is kind of what the new curriculum looks like. Um, we also have two 24-week internships just to make it interesting. 
Um, and you'll see that we have, um, so for example, we have uh, structures A subject and structures B subject. So after the structures A subject, the students can come and begin to do a studio, which draws on their knowledge of structures and materials and manufacturing. Um, they do design of machines, then they can then do a studio. Um, uh, it would be this application studio A. They do thermofluids A, they do thermofluids B, they do a studio on thermofluids. So that's the way that we, we convince the academics to stop worrying about all this advanced material that they want to teach. In fact, in some ways, the studios provide more opportunity for advanced material to be taught. Um, so that's, that's the big idea. Um, send me an email if you want to know more. Um, but for many of you, I think, <clears throat> You think, well, how, how do we how do we bring these ideas into into the curriculum? And for people I know, we all started down here. We started with small projects in the subjects that we're teaching, and then we started to think, well, how how could we change uh, change this on a bigger scale? Well, maybe my subject and your subject might form a sequence of subjects, and we could we could work together on a project. Well, maybe we could run a project across a semester across three or four different subjects. And then maybe we get to the stage where we are with mechanical engineering, where we have a project subject in every semester. And then we can do other grand things like combine subjects into bigger units. I've got plenty of stories to tell about all of those things. Um, I'm going to skip over questions, leave questions to the end. If you do want to make change, what we do know internationally is you need, eventually you can, you can make change at small scale in your subjects, but eventually you need the support of discipline leaders, heads of school, heads of departments, deans, associate deans, and so on. And you also really need learning designers to help. And those people might not be in your faculty, they might be in the university, but you need them to come and help you to, to, to achieve the learning outcomes you want to achieve. Um, and of course, you need academics and you need capable students who really want to do these things. So if you've read any of Ruth Graham's reports, um, she did a study of this back in 2012 and identified, well, what what leads to excellence in engineering education, and particularly what leads to persistence. So programs that get changed and stay changed. And um, they usually start with a crisis. We've all had a crisis. So COVID is a great crisis. And uh, somebody once said, and I'm trying to remember who said, you know, never, never, um, never, uh, you know, never miss the opportunity that, that a crisis produces. It's not the right words, but it'll come back to me. Um, be ambitious, aim high, use heads of departments and schools, engage with your academics, do team teaching. And unfortunately, even then many innovations are not sustained. So key ideas today to sum up, and then we'll go to questions. So we really do need to change curricula for a rapidly changing world. And it's been fantastic to see in the chat that so many of you are already doing many of these things. And this is a wonderful international community that if we could keep that going in Canvas, uh, that, that we, we have lots of people to learn from. Students need to deal with complexity and particularly sustainability. Um, we can use a systematic team-based approach and that's what we're doing very much at UTS. We need heads of departments and schools as our critical allies for long-term change. And don't forget your students because they are absolutely dynamic and they will have lots of really good ideas that you could work with. Um, and that was our experience in Summer Studio. So, and really just a reminder of the, this wonderful model of adult learning motivation. We, I've shared my expertise. I think I've made the content relevant. We've done action and reflection. We've done teamwork and, and you've had lots of choice along the way. So I'm going to pause there with some. Great. We've got a few so let's minutes uh, let's have a few more uh, questions or comments. Okay. 
Uh, as I put on this chat, I will resend the invites to Canvas to all of you in case you missed the first time it was sent to you or in case you joined here for the first time. Okay. So questions, comments, next few minutes to before we say goodbye, five minutes to go. Roger, to what extent, this is from James Trevelyan, to what extent are the systems and processes in your studio project units documented? And to what extent do teaching teams follow and update modified documentation such as individual lesson plans? <laughs> um, well, we've, we've written several papers, um, James, that, that I'm happy to share. Um, so we, we, we've written papers around the general approach. We've, we've also had several papers from our electrical and data engineers who uh, are generally a little bit ahead of the rest of the faculty. So uh, I can dig up those papers and, and share those on the Canvas site. Okay, great. Um, yeah, the second part was about lesson plans. Um, I'd have to take that as a question on notice. Mm. Okay, let's um, get some more comments, reactions, questions from the audience. There's a, okay, this is a Franca Wagner from Brazil, civil engineering professor. I usually find some resistance in changing from both students and professors. How do you deal with it? <laughs> That's an understatement. Um, yes, well, well, the first time we ran summer studios, I must admit, um, it didn't run, a couple of them didn't run quite as smoothly as I expected. And, and it was less about students not wanting to do it because after all, they'd all volunteered in a sense, they'd all enrolled was that they, they didn't quite understand the, the whole way the, the, the studio ran. And for the second, for our second instance, we did much better training with our academics. So they really, in a sense, scaffolded the students in those first two or three classes. So that the students really understood the process of the studio and not just what, what they were being asked to do. Um, and the thing that I realized was that students hadn't ever learned to ask questions in, in the way that you deal with a client. That is, uh, okay, now I can see what you've asked me to do, but, but there are some immediate questions in my mind that I need to ask you. And they'd, ne they'd, they'd, they'd never learned that kind of professional dialogue. They expected that they'd get an assignment sheet, they'd read it, they'd go away and submit in several weeks time without ever speaking to the teacher again. And that's not how a studio runs. And so we had to teach our academics how to how to run this much more interactive uh, uh, studio experience, uh, which we, which we did much better the second time around. I should so say. A couple of people have uh, exchanged ideas that students are easier to convince than faculty, and a bunch of other mm. people have agreed with that. And these are <laughs> faculty. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think that, that was the value of, of the summer studio elective experience was that the academics who wanted to be involved and, the, and some of them who volunteered really surprised me because I saw them as quite traditional academics. And yet, you know, they, they put their hands up. They said, yes, let's, let's do this. And they came away and said, that was fantastic. That was you know, completely different to, to, to what I'd done before. So it's it's always hard to judge who's going to move and who's not going to move. How to strike a balance this is from Vijayalakshmi, how to strike a balance between laying a foundation as well as application and innovation level to manage the time. Well, that's, you know, that's really what we've done with the mechanical program. So, so we said, okay, students do need to be taught the fundamentals in in quite controlled ways, but even each of those fundamental subjects actually has a, a small project at the end. So there's you know eight to ten weeks of of um, if you like quite structured learning, and then three to four weeks of of project, um, and that's so that students are never far from putting their their like um, new new learning into into practice. Yeah. Okay, the well, comment is that once faculty sometimes start changing, once they see how enthusiastic the students are, which is good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. 
Okay, so looks like we are run out of time here, Roger, and uh, I think we need to close. Uh, it's um, five o'clock Indian time and uh, one and a mm half -hmm. hour past the starting of our session. So thank you all folks. This has been a fantastic session and uh, I'm glad that we have some of our past and future uh, webinar speakers also here with us. Uh, it's exciting, mm -hmm. and let's keep the conversation going. As I said, you know, as uh, you know, Richard and our, we were all disappointed that no one really took advantage of Canvas since the presentation that uh, Richard and, and Rebecca made. Okay, so let's all get into the habit of maybe once a week to start a curiosity, you know, logging into Canvas and see what's new, and and put your mm -hmm. own thoughts in there. Okay, that's a nice uh, little fun way to uh, to connect with mm -hmm. this community, and we'll try to prompt you with uh, some questions of our own. Okay, uh, and mm -hmm. with that, thank you all. And have a good day, evening, morning, wherever you are, different parts of the world. And stay healthy, stay happy, and stay peaceful. All right? Take care, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.